Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Lettis and I'm with ICF and part of the consultant team leading this research effort. Along with High Street Consulting and Applied Pavement Technology on effective methods for setting transportation performance targets. I'm, joining, I'm joined today by Brad Allen from Applied Pavement Technology, who will also be facilitating, and panelists Phil Clements from South Dakota DOT and Reed Kennery from Vermont DOT. Today's workshop is the fourth in a series of six web-based workshops, the purpose of which are to raise awareness of the results of the research effort, which is the guidebook on effective methods for setting transportation performance targets, provide useful information to help transportation practitioners understand effective methods for setting transportation performance targets, how to implement those methods, and what issues to consider in selecting a method, drawing on the research conducted throughout the study, and help transportation practitioners to further engage in dialogue on target setting methods to learn from the results of the study and from each other. The focus of this workshop is on target setting methods for pavement condition measures. So before we get started, I'd like to know that this workshop will be recorded and make sure that everyone is able to navigate the Zoom platform. After each of our speakers and at the end of the workshop, there will be time for questions. And as questions come up throughout the workshop, feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand, um, which you can find by navigating to the bottom of your Zoom screen. And when you raise your hand, one of the facilitators will give you the ability to unmute. All right, thank you. I'll now hand it over to Brad. Thanks, Sarah. So as Sarah mentioned, we're here today um, at a workshop to discuss effective methods for setting pavement targets. And this is being conducted in support of NCHRP Project 2307, um, which is developing a guide on that subject uh, with the purpose of helping state DOTs and MPOs um, identify effective methods for setting uh, their transportation performance targets uh, with a focus on uh, the federal TPM or transportation performance management targets, but the uh, techniques and the approaches that we'll, we uh, are described in the guide and we'll discuss today really can be applied to um, any measure that you wish to set a target for. So a little bit on the guide itself, which is currently undergoing review uh, by uh, Transportation Research Board for publication. Um, it's, it's separated into several parts. So the, the first part of the guide really is an overview of target setting um, and approaches provides an introduction, kind of the foundation for target setting and provides some practical tips um, that are applicable across different technical approaches for target setting. Um, part two lays out um, fairly technical details related to setting targets um, in terms of the various uh, measures established under the Federal Transportation Performance Management Regulations um, for safety, infrastructure, reliability, and traffic congestion. So the uh, approaches that are introduced in part one are provided, more details provided on them in parts two, specific to the different uh, performance areas. Um, and then part three of the guide um, raises the level back up and sums things up again, kind of cutting across all the areas to talk about um, why it's important to set targets. Um, and what if the agency has other measures that they want to set targets for? How can they go about that? And included within the guide, um, actually in, in both parts two and three, are practice examples that were identified during the research. All right. So um, the target setting approaches, again, there's technical approaches, and that's what we'll be focusing on today, but there are a few aspects of target setting that cut across these technical approaches. So um, in general, these are kind of the um, generic approaches to setting targets. So through the research, we identified um, that you may have a policy-based approach to setting a target, which is simply that you as an agency are going to select 
um, a threshold or a level of achievement that you expect to um, achieve in a given period of time and set that as a policy. So in the infrastructure world, this might be something like establishing no more than 5% of your pavements on the interstate are in poor condition, which would align with the minimum um, requirements, the condition requirements that are established um, through the asset management requirements. Slightly more uh, sophisticated would be to use historic performance to model the future and just looking at where have you been in your performance and what does that trend indicate about where you will be in the future. You can then modify those historic trends based on different contributing factors and we'll talk about that in detail um, in a minute. There's also probabilistic and risk-based approaches. Um, and these account for variability and performance and they're developed using confidence intervals. And, and these will establish an upper and lower bounds of potential performance. Um, and you can use that range to help determine where best to set your targets. So these are used more in uh, the system performance and safety areas, and they currently are for infrastructure conditions, but probabilistic modeling is something that is of uh, a major topic right now in the area of infrastructure conditions. All right, then statistical models, um, beyond simply using historical trends, um, statistical models that can account for explanatory factors and establishing re regression models. Using deterministic models, this better describes what is current practice for pavement management, where we have lots of factors that may contribute to the performance of a pavement, and we establish deterministic models to describe that performance, and our speakers will get into that in a bit more detail. Um, and then, of course, there's all sorts of other tools, and that's, you can see, asset management systems listed there. But asset management systems really apply one or more of the uh, of the approaches that are, are described above, just in rather sophisticated ways and specific for one or more assets. So with that, you can also, with any one of those approaches, you can also have an overall target setting philosophy. As an agency, you may have a conservative target setting philosophy. Um, and, and this is in some uh, instances where there is considerable risk to not attaining a target, some type of penalty uh, that may be real or perceived, um, your agency may want to set a target that you can easily achieve. Um, you, may, you may instead want to set a more realistic target or a target that is based on your expected level of performance. Um, maybe you have a long-term goal and you wanna set short-term targets to help make sure you're on that path to achieving your long-term goal. Uh, what are the, the outcomes you think are most likely? Oops, sorry. You may also um, have set aspirational goals, which would reflect um, a commitment to improving conditions. Um, and, and this might typically in infrastructure be a longer term goal. This is very common in safety performance um, when it comes to reducing fatalities. Very often agencies will set very strong aspirational goals like towards zero deaths. So not so much, um, we, we do see this in infrastructure, but specifically related to TPM, um, we typically either see conservative or realistic target setting approaches. All right, so what makes a target setting effective? This is a question we tackle in the guide and it was asked by the, the research panel over and over again of us. And there are lots of factors that, that may make um, one method more or less effective for your agency. And effectiveness is not something that can really be applied universally. It really depends on your agency, uh, your approach to target setting, um, and how what you need to get out of target setting. Um, so in some cases, ease of application may make a target setting approach um, effective. If, if it's something you're, if it's an approach that your agency doesn't have the data or skills um, or knowledge or software systems to apply, then it wouldn't be a, a very effective measure uh, or method. Um, but you also want a, 
a an approach that is technically robust that you can defend right that says no there's something behind this um it's it's not just our whim or our engineering judgment or something like that and you need to be able to communicate that easily so those two things technical robustness and ease of communication don't always work hand in hand um and i think we'll look to talk about that during our discussion towards the end of today um, and you also have to allow for policy considerations. So are there things that are driving your ability to achieve a given level of performance? So this could be different um, in the case of, say, a pavement target. This could be a commitment to other level areas of performance, um, other asset conditions or system performance that says you can't direct unlimited funding towards your pavement performance. You have to take that into account as you're setting these targets. All right, so with that, we'll just quickly mention uh, the pavement performance measures that we consider and describe in the guide when setting targets um, are as established through the federal transportation performance management requirements. So this is the percentage of interstate pavements in good or fair condition and the percentage of non-interstate NHS pavements in good or fair conditions as defined in uh, 23 CFR 490 Part C. So uh, we do get into some technical challenges with calculating those measures and using those measures for setting targets um, and do discuss some of the differences between those measures that agencies set targets and report on versus measures that agencies may be using uh, for making decisions. And I think both of our speakers will touch on that in their presentations. All right, so what are the methods that we identified for pavement target setting? And you can see these here listed really in order of ascending technical robustness. These aren't necessarily, any method isn't necessarily more effective or better than another. Again, it really comes down to your agency's um, uh, abilities and, and desires in the areas of target setting. So a policy-based approach um, we called targeted change. So is there a level of performance you want to set and achieve? Um, and it, there may not be a technical uh, reason for that. And the example used earlier of um, setting your target at uh, the um, the level that would incur some type of penalty under federal regulations might be a good example of a policy-based uh, targeted change. Time series trend, again, what has been the reported performance of your pavements over the last several years as reported through the uh, highway performance uh, management system, monitoring system, rather, HPMS, um, and what does that suggest of the future? Typically, that trend is modified by agencies to account by changes in funding. And there's really two types of changes in funding. Those would be um, the amount of funding or the way the funding is being used. I'll talk about that in a second. And uh, you may use your model, you may use your asset management system to predict conditions. Um, and then beyond that, you may use your asset management model to predict conditions under different scenarios. Um, and in doing so, kind of combined the process of establishing your budget, establishing your program expectations, and your targets at the same time. And that could be done if you're looking to set targets for performance and uh, infrastructure conditions, maybe across more than one asset at the same time. So a few details um, on each approach. The targeted change, again, it's the simplest approach. Uh, the downside to targeted change is there's nothing technical to it, so it doesn't really provide any insights um, to causes or outcomes. Uh, it, it can be defended, certainly. Usually there is a basis behind it that can be defended, like setting the target at um, some level that incurs a penalty, um, but it's not a, a technical reason. So a time series trend, you can see an example, we're all familiar of these. It's just uh, an extrapolation of uh, the, the straight line from 
your historic performance forward. Maybe it isn't a straight line. I mean, depending on how your historic performance lines up. In this example, it was. Um, so this is a relatively simple approach. You can use uh, common spreadsheet tools, things like that. Um, but it doesn't take into account changes um, that may be taking place uh, in your funding, in your strategies, or in your conditions. All right, so to time series uh, trend plus future funding, as I mentioned before, takes into account typically either changes in overall funding amount, hey, we're going to be able to spend more money on pavements, or maybe we're going to be spending money on pavements differently. In some states, um, around the time that target setting was taking place in 2018, the last time around, were also in the process of, up, of establishing their first asset management plans, um, and we're changing their approach to pavement management and changing maybe from a worst first approach to more of a preservation approach. Um, and so there shouldn't be an expectation that historical condition trends would continue. Um, other states we're seeing, as we are now, an influx of funding, in this case from the new uh, federal funding bill, uh, where for the next year we're going to start to see uh, a rather significant increase in funding and then uh, more modest increases through about 2026 at least. Um, but we're also seeing inflation, um, cost increases. So all of that can factor into, do you think your historic trends will continue and how might we wanna modify that trend? All right, so if you wanna step beyond just looking at past outcomes and modeling them forward, you can use your pavement management system um, to forecast conditions uh, based on various sets of, of outputs. And the first step to this would be to model what you think would happen, right? This is to set realistic targets. Um, you know, this is uh, defensible. People generally have confidence in their pavement management systems and you can explain it, although it's a very complex process, it can generally be explained um, rather simply on its surface. However, it does require that you have confidence in your pavement management system um, and that you have good quality data to base that on. So the next option and seems to, it was one that not many states documented in 2018, but I think given the increase in maturity over the last four years, and particularly the, the kind of uncertain times we are in right now when it comes to cost and funding and things like that, uh, is scenario analysis. So this is where we look at multiple scenarios um, and then determine what we think uh, is the most likely scenario and where we wanna set our target based on all of those inputs. We could still set a conservative target, but it would be based on a number of scenarios run in the pavement management system. Typically the easiest thing to vary in this is overall funding, but you can, depending on how your system is set up, um, look at different strategies or uh, increase or, or decrease unit costs through inflation rates or um, other factors that may allow you discount rates, things like that, that may allow you to run some what if scenarios and then come up with um, multiple outputs to review through the target setting process. So that's a, a rather quick overview of the different approaches. Um, but now we're going to look uh, a little more practically at this through a couple presentations. And uh, the order that was on the first agenda slide was actually incorrect. Um, our first presenter will be uh, Phil Clements from South Dakota DOT. Um, I'm really excited to have both of our speakers here with us today. I don't think we could find two more knowledgeable people um, on pavement management, and they're also excellent speakers. So. Um, we'll have the two presentations. After each presentation, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. And then following uh, questions from Reed's presentation, we'll have a discussion um, uh, period for everybody. And what we would like to have, uh, we have some questions to ask everyone about your experience uh, with target setting in the past, and in particular, what you're looking to do um, for setting pavement targets uh, that need to be reported early this fall to FHWA. Um, so before I introduce uh, Phil and Reed though, to get things started, uh, Sarah, I believe we have a, a poll question. Yes, thank you. So um, 
but I just went through the five the five approaches and just kind of ask you for the target setting process, your most recent target setting process. So maybe the one you're going through now or just completed, or if you haven't quite started for 2022, your 2018 target, what, uh, which of those five approaches best describes um, your intended target setting approach? So folks are answering, this is great. And you can see it's a, it's a mix. Um, percentages are changing quite a bit, but it's... All right. Think Things are slowing down a little bit. Hopefully everybody can see the results. Um, so it looks like about 10% um, are using just uh, targeted change. Um, and then it's pretty even between time series change, uh, trend model-based and scenario analysis, which is great. And, and um, a few folks, about 12, 10, 12% using time series trend plus future funding. So a real mix of approaches. And um, that's not really surprising, but it's great to see. Um, and the one thing I will, one more thing I'll mention um, before we get into the presentations is that these aren't the only five approaches. They're more representative of typical approaches across the spectrum of technical analyses that you can do to support your target setting. So we don't want to say that these are the only five things that you can do. And it's very likely you as an agency may use more than one of these to inform your target setting um, or something that's a bit of a hybrid of, of two or more of these approaches. And, and you know, that that's important. It's, it's really what makes it effective for your agency um, is, is your being able to have confidence in, in the approach so that you can set a target um, that serves your purposes for your agency. So, all right, thank you. So with that, I'll introduce um, our speakers. Our first speaker, uh, Phil Clements, is the pavement management engineer of the South Dakota DOT. His main responsibilities in that role include operation of the pavement management system, managing the state highway pavement project recommendations, and providing future, excuse me, future data projections for strategic planning for pavements, and that's across the whole state system. He graduated from Boise State University in 1997 uh, with a civil engineering degree, and he started right after that at the DOT in 1998. Um, his starting job with the DOT was the assistant pavement management engineer, and he became the pavement management engineer in 2018, which means uh, for his entire 24 years with the DOT, he's been in pavement management. As I said, we have some very knowledgeable folks with us today. Uh, our second speaker I will be Reed Kinnery from the uh, Vermont Agency of Transportation, and he's their pavement management lead. Um, he's worked at VTrans for nearly 31 years, and for the past 23 years, he's been working with the agency's pavement management system. Um, that system over that time has grown into a broader asset management system referred to as uh, Vermont Asset Management Information System, or VAMIS, um, and Reed's a key part of that implementation. Um, Reed is a graduate of Texas Tech University from uh, back in the class of 1987, and he's also an avid skier and biker. So glad to have Phil and Reed with us today. And with that, I'll turn things over to Phil. Good day to all. I hope everybody's having a good day. Um, we'll wait for the slide to come up here. Oh, here it comes. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, as Brad said, I'm Phil Clements, uh, South Dakota Department of Transportation. Um, 
today. Uh, I'd like to tell you this, uh, our story of uh, setting our pavement targets for uh, TPM. Uh, next slide, please. So our, um, our overview of this is we're gonna talk how the initial targets were set for SDDOT, what the initial target results were, configuring the pavement management system for analysis uh, to come up with targets, uh, how we will view setting targets in the future. And then we will, as Brad said, we will have some uh, dis uh, question or discussion. Next slide. So we start out our, our story with the original way that SDDOT set its four-year targets. When looking at our initial approach, you could say that it was more of a time series trend approach where you project conditions based on historic data and regression. You could also say that it was a targeted change approach where we establish a target based on recent performance or the baseline. And then, you know, after looking at the methods outlined for this presentation, I would say that it was more, more complicated than that with elements of both and a look at the stability of the, of the state SCI, which we'll get into in a minute, what the SCI is, using historical data and regression. We is, and we assumed a steady state for the system so that we could use more of a targeted change approach. Next slide. So my plan to come up with these first targets, uh, well, it kind of hovered around the hopes and dreams that I would find a good correlation between the state surface condition index or SCI uh, versus the PM2 good fair poor data. But as I dug deeper and deeper into this task, I, I, I realized that this was not to be. And so I, I found out that I had a lot more work to do than I thought. Next slide. You see that, the South Dakota DOT SCI or surface condition index and the, the PM2 um, good, fair, poor are two totally different animals. The SCI is an overall measure of the health of the pavement derived by taking the means, the mean of the indices involved uh, or, or uh, condition indexes minus 1.25 times the standard deviation of the indices. And what that standard deviation does in there is it gives a little more, more bite to your low, lower indices, thus lowering your overall number. Um, the PM2 GFP is derived from a set of matrices that determines overall good, fair, and poor based on the good, fair, or poor of the individual industries. There are no numbers calculated for each segment, just a good, fair, or poor for each segment plus the mag matrices for the various pavement types, varying criteria for what it takes to attain a, a poor versus a, a good on the scale. Next slide. So my best bet was to sort all of the segments that were considered good and poor in the federal standard and see what range of SCI we could get for good and poor. I did this for both NHS interstate and non-interstate. And for the sake of time with this uh, presentation, I'll concentrate on the interstate. You can see the results of this initial analysis here. The percentage of lane mileage is, is what we're looking at, the, uh, the column on the right. Um, I had to realize um, in looking at this that we were working with the HPMS 2017 submittal data for the federal standards. So in this data set, for CRC, which we do have CRC on our state system of almost 20% at this point. Uh, the 2017 HPMS reporting did not take into account current distress issues on our CRC pavement, but our state index, which had what we call a CRC block cracking index in it, which was another distress did. So taking that into effect, Another, I used another sort of the segment without the CRC segments. Go to the next slide. And on that next slide, you can see that, that sort without uh, the CRC in it. So I came up with another set of ranges you see here. I selected the targets based on the lowest value of range for good and the highest value of range for poor on both of these, um, 
these different tables. So as you can see uh, listed below, the highest poor percentage, which is listed on this, uh, on this slide is uh, 2.39, which I said four. And then the lowest good percentage, which was 62.6 .6 on the previous slide was, was what I used uh, for the interstate. Um, then, you know, it seemed pretty simple, right? I, you know, and, but I, I kind of felt uneasy about it. I visited with our program manager, a division director about this, and I was assured I was not expected to be able to predict precisely what was to happen. That kind of pained me to some, some degree. And besides, we had the knowledge that we could adjust our targets at the midpoint of the four year period if, if we had to. Next slide. So how did we do? Well, as you can see, the targets that I set turned out to be rather conservative. So our, our target for interstate 62.6 .6 for good and 2.4 for poor, we ended up having an actual performance at midpoint of 75.8 and then 0% for poor. And then you can kind of see the same um, when you look at the NHS non-interstate um, we were a bit closer uh, with the NHS non-interstate, uh, especially in the poor range. And I attribute that to the fact that we do not have any CRC on that system, and most of it is asphalt. So we had a better, we had better AC cracking data in that 2017 data set. So we were able to predict that a little bit. And then in this time frame in the submissions to HPMS and checking and rechecking the, the data, you know, our, our data that was collected in accordance with our data quality management plan, we were starting to build confidence in the HPMS data. And as time progressed, we had something to go off of, of some way of checking how things looked. And, but however, at the midpoint target check, uh, we decided to stay with what we had, mainly because I was still developing um, a new way to analysis or a better way. And it was decided to use the new analysis for our next four year period going forward. Next slide. So I started working on using the pavement management system to come up with targets. We had to add a new set of analysis variables. These new variables would not be analyzed in the models. We would still retain the current distresses collected by our our state to be analyzed and, and determine our pavement needs. Uh, but rather the, the new variables or analysis variables would piggyback on the existing system. Now I could go on for hours for how the, on how this was accomplished. And, but so for, for the sake of time, I will summarize this without going too deep in the weeds. Next slide. So the HPMS data already resides in the database portion of our pavement management system, and we have had it that way for many years. Taking the HPMS data, we converted that data, the IRI, the rutting, and faulting data, to the state-defined zero to five index that we use for our analysis um, on the state side. Next slide. Along with that, we took the cracking indexes for jointed concrete pavement, GCP, uh, continuing reinforced concrete, CRC, and AC pavements, and converted them as follows. The JCP cracking was held constant. This is because this type of cracking is rare in South Dakota. The CRCP cracking model is set to the state's CRC block cracking index, a state index that was created several years ago that is very similar to the longitudinal crack or punch out criteria for the HPMS. The AC cracking model is set to the state index for fatigue cracking. With the conversion of IRI, rutting, faulting, and the CRCP and AC cracking to a state index, we can then utilize the deterioration curve that are already established in our pavement management system for our different pavement families, rather than having to analyze and come up with new curves that are based on the raw HPMS data. Next slide. 
And then so, so by doing that and feeding this into our analysis, this sets everything in the motion, into motion and the variables for the analysis that we added and are piggybacking in the system do two things in the model. First, if they are not acted upon within the range of years that we're looking at, they will show deterioration with the exception of JCP cracking over the range of years of the analysis. Two, if it is acted upon by some sort of a treatment in the model within the range of years, they will reset to a level consistent with the prescribed treatment and then deteriorate in years where the treatment is not applied. The numbers are then converted back to the HPMS type of index and the HPMS good, fair, or poor designation is assigned to each index and the overall index is calculated. Next slide. Now the timing and overall time required to set this up was, was kind of complicated. And as, as stated, I, I took the uh, paper management engineer in 2018 after becoming the assistant, but my replacement in my old position was not filled until that following summer. So I was, I was a year on my own doing two duties, if you will. In summer of 2019, I was, I was training uh, my replacement, Danny, for the old position, or for my old position. Um, so again, I didn't get much done. This kind of sounds like a bunch of excuses, but you know, it's, it, it's kind of a busy world for the pavement management engineer, as many of you can think of. But then COVID hit. And with that, we had to cancel our annual visual distress survey where we send our interns out every year. And the summers of 2020 and 2021 was when I put this all together. And we had more time on our hands, many update tasks other than this were accomplished. So this was in addition to my usual duties. So with many interruptions, it took about 120 hours over two summers, plus another 40 hours for testing the system. Next slide. Once this was set up, every time I run an analysis, the PM2 variables are set into motion along with it. The additional time to run the analysis is actually quite negligible. To run a full analysis in, in the DTIM system usually takes, depending on what, the system, uh, what funding category we're looking at, usually it will take about two to four hours to run. So the time difference was really not that much different. We now have the ability though with this to set targets using a payment management based analysis. Not only that, but we also normally run a specified number of funding scenarios when we run our analysis. We have the capability to look at PM2 variables using a scenario analysis. And if a special scenario is requested, it does not take long to configure that new scenario and run it as part of the current analysis. Next slide. With all this being said, SDDOT has a set of internal performance measures that we have based on SCI. And here's a list of those goals. We work with it a range rather than a single target. The minimum SCI is the level where we do not wish our payments to go below. Why is that? Well, this is our theoretical point of no return um, uh, level. And at or below that level, it would require a major increase in funding to recover. The, the goal SCI, on the other hand, is the ideal level we wish to achieve or optimal level we would wish to achieve across our funding categories and our overall network. Next slide. <clears throat> Along with that, we were required to report annually to our state legislature on our projected SCI conditions over a 10 year period. And if we are going to maintain our goals, if we, for some reason, see that we cannot maintain our at or above our goals in the 10 year period, we need to provide to the state legislature how we are gonna alleviate the situation. Next slide. Finally, the SDDOT has, by year four, most of our pavement STIP projects programmed. 
rehab type projects come in year five. This includes most AC overlay work, which is a large percentage of the pavement projects in the state. And then our reconstruction or regrading comes in usually around year eight. Now, just to kind of, our, our step is actually a four year step, but it's, it's kind of a two part step. Years five through eight is what is known as a developmental step. And it's, it's projects that we bring in where we can kind of get a head start on some of the scoping and, and design and different requir requirements that you have for um, different, uh, let's say environmental regulations, or if you might have right away coming into play. So just a little aside there. I could go on for that forever too. Next slide. Okay, and then I guess just a little bit of a show and tell here. Uh, here's our current projection from our last run um for our interstate and as you can see um across the top there's there's supposed to be red there there really isn't that much red on that um and if you go to the next slide this is our projection for the nhs non-interstate now contrast that with if you go to the next slide we can see the sci chart for the for the interstate. And then can you go two slides back and we can kind of see the see the difference there or kind of see how it it kind of has a similar trend there um, with the uh, with the SCI, but it's the, obviously it's not the same. Um, and then let's see, go a couple slides ahead here. Yeah, and, and here is the NHS non-interstate in, in terms of SCI. Um, so as you can see, our SCI has a little bit more of a bite when it comes to identifying what we consider poor pavements and then what the um, what PM2 considers to be a poor, or HPMS considers to be a poor pavement. So, um, and next slide, and with that, I guess would be our question and discussion period. Um, if you would like more information on the South Dakota Pavement Management Program, here's the website. Um, and with that, um, I guess I'll hand, that, hand this back to Brad. Thanks, Phil. You're not off that easy. So now's <laughs> a chance to ask questions um, of Phil. If you'd like to, you can uh, type them into the chat or you can raise your hand um, and we can unmute you to, to ask a question. Um, I'll get things started. Just to, to clarify, um, as you're moving towards your ability, I guess, to translate, um, between your SCI and the, the federal indexes. Is that done kind of self-contained within your pavement management system? So if you do a run, you immediately get outputs in both, or is that a second tool that you post-process? No, you, you get immediate output from that. Um, granted, you, you will have to go in and do some... Um, you might have to do a little filtering with the outputs that you have, but it's it's not that much more work to uh, be able to obtain those results. Interstate systems real easy because you don't have to worry about any any crossovers. We you know we have that as one separate funding category, so that's real easy. Major arterial there are some crossovers into the different funding categories with the NHS, mm -hmm. so a little bit of filtering is required, but it's it's not bad. All right, a quick follow up to that. And then we have someone with a hand raised, but I see in the chat just, um, and so if you don't mind mentioning, what is the PMS that you you operate? Uh, it is uh, DTMS BA uh, with, uh, with Dayton. All right, thanks. And then I see uh, we have Dorothy, Adelot, I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong there. Let me... I think we can get you off the mute. Dorothy, if you can unmute yourself, go ahead and um, ask your question.
I'm not sure while we're working that out. Um, as seeing that there was a question about how much uh, CRC there is on our, our system, on the yes. interstate system, we have about 260, we call two-way miles or, or carriage miles on our state system that composes about 19% uh, uh, of our interstate that we have. And then, um, and then if you break down the rest of the pavements are jointed concrete, uh, is about 43% on the interstate and asphalt concretes are about 37%. And, and then with our NHS non-interstate, the percentages are uh, for jointed concrete, 27% and asphalt concrete is 73%. Great. Um, and then we have somebody looking for more details on SDI. Um, is there a link we could provide or the link you provided? Will that give that to them? Is that SCI? SCI, I think, is probably what was meant, yeah. Yeah, in that link um, that I provided at the end of the slideshow um, on our state website, there's a, there's a document that is known as, as a synopsis. It is basically our, um, our operating manual, if you will, of the pavement management system and the documentation for the SCI should be within that. Great. Thanks. I will uh, vouch that is a fantastic document. Um, and it's not only uh, a, a breakdown of kind of an explanation of how the pavement management system works, but it also provides the why. It's like a history of South Dakota's pavement management system, which really makes it a rich source of information. And I think a good model as, as an aside that, that other agencies might want to follow. Um, all right, any other questions? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I see Lewis Vegans is asking for that link in the chat. So I'll work on, oh. There it is. Steve, <laughs> Steve from Alaska to the rescue. Bada bing. <laughs> I was going to work on that while we move to the next presentation, but thank you very much, Steve. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank All you right. for the opportunity to present. Um, and I'm sure the, the panel discussion will be uh, um, colorful. We'll, we'll just put it that way. I'm hoping it'll be colorful. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Yep. All right. And uh, so we'll bring up Reed's presentation. Hello. Uh... My name is Reed Kennery and I am from the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Everybody seems to get uh, kind of hung up on the agency thing, but <laughs> it's just what we got called. Um, I, I, I think that uh, I have a lot of similarities with uh, what Phil did. And then we have some differences as well too. So uh, I obviously don't have as, as many slides or as many graphs, but uh, realistically in, uh, Elias, you can go to the next slide right now. Really, why we were here was uh, the government made the rule, and now we got to comply to to keep getting money, right? So uh, that's what we're doing. And uh, Elias, you can go right to the next slide. So just to give like a, a little background, right? Everybody, I think, was kind of in the same boat when this kind of came down the, the, the line. What did you have and what did you need um, in, in order to, to get to these national performance measures? I think we were pretty lucky from a distress standpoint where we were already getting um, the data we needed to calculate this. We had to make a few changes to uh, uh, our wheel path diagram and how we were doing some of that stuff. But it, we had the raw data to, to calculate these things, which did make that <laughs> a, a lot easier to do. We also had that full distress on the entire system, so we didn't have to worry about that too much. Um, and, and the fact that we did have a, a pavement management system where we could incorporate all these things pretty easily 
is another one as well too. So the, the what we needed, well, we needed to make some changes in the cracking definition. Um, everybody is probably fairly familiar with what that definition is, but our agency distresses, we have two cracking indices that we use in our composite index calculation and they are not the same, right? So we had to kind of refine that. We had to redo some calculations there. Um, and what we don't have that we still need is to develop that deterioration model now for that specific national performance measure cracking, right? Because it, it is its own thing. I back calculated some, I've not built a deterioration model yet to this point. And then after all that, then you can kind of do some target setting because if you really don't know any of that stuff, it's kind of like you're just getting pushed to the edge of the cliff, not knowing what's coming next. So in terms of that, then the other thing that we had to kind of put together along with that was the overall data quality management plan where the hows of how you're gonna get all that data are kind of summed up and everything. So we can go to the the next, Next slide. So when it came to setting the targets, you know, we looked at our cracking indices, we looked at our composite index from a historical trend perspective, right? And said, well, you know, is anything really changing, you know, at our own measure? And we're doing that all the time anyways, as part of the payment management system. And then we looked at these various budget scenarios, which is again, you know, standard operating procedure for us. And then we said, well, where are we, right? And we knew where we are. We were less than 1%, whether that was 0.3 or 0.8 or something like that. But we did the, uh, the targeted change method of saying, if the, if the rule says five, we'll set it at 4.9. And conservatively, <laughs> that's the, okay, because we don't know what our policy is going to be into the future, right? That's even more unknown than our funding sources for the, for the most part. So that's kind of what we left it at overall. Um, I, I think that you can see any of those things on the, the TPM site and you can look at everybody's targets for where they have for the goods and everything, but we, we picked them, right? And we picked them based on the, the best information that we had available to us. But we also did look at the historical trends. We also used the payment management system. So I'll call it a, a conservative educated guess if you, if you really want to put the, put the methodology together there. Um, and it, it does take some setup and it does take some, some consideration of a lot of the things that are there. Um, but one of the things with the targets that we, we wanted to make sure that we considered was the fact that we do have a, another network besides the NHS to, to manage out there. So if, if really we are at 1% and that would be a reasonable target, it, it, do you really want to set your target there knowing that you may have to spend significantly more money on other parts of your network over a couple of years where that kind of puts that target in jeopardy and we really didn't want to do that. So we picked four or nine, are we going to adjust that moving forward in the future? I'm not sure at this time, but that's, that's kind of where we're at. And that was really overall the, the, the methodology that, that we used. Uh, next slide. I, I think that this is just it, right? These are all right off the uh, FHWA TPM website. Uh, I, I don't know where the 2020 numbers are, but I, I'm guessing they're coming. And uh, the what's the next? What's the next slide? Uh, yeah, that's just the link to where all those uh, charts are, in case you are not going there regularly to uh, to look at that kind of stuff. Um, and, and realistically, I think that's all, all I have from the, the target setting, right? Uh, we talked about some of the methods and we really used a, a mix of them. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of details surrounding all of them. And that's what I think we're supposed to have some conversation about. So I'm ready for questions. All right. Thanks, Reed. Uh, questions for... For Reed, so kind of took a mix of approaches to um, similar to, to Phil uh, for 2018 to then kind of end up with um, 
a, a kind of a targeted improvement, if you want to call it that, but a, <laughs> a targeted target, um, but but an informed yep. decision from from lots of different angles. Yeah, and I think there was definitely a lot of similarities, right? We realized uh, pretty quickly that that our composite index from our agency performance measure w was not going to be in line with what we are coming up with with good, fair, poor, uh, based on calculating a metric in a completely different manner. So uh, we didn't really pursue the, the correlation side of things at all uh, as part of what we were looking at. Great. I'm going to, I'll lead things off because I'm, I'm looking down the attendees. We have a fairly informed group. I'm seeing a lot of familiar names from various pavement management efforts. So you did mention the cracking metric um, and we don't in the guide get into the, the details of the various metrics, um, but we do just, we introduce them briefly and, and, and the guide spends a little bit more time talking about the uh, the tenth mile basis for calculating the federal measures from those metrics. Um, so that's one issue. But you brought up the the wheel path cracking metric for for flexible pavements, um, and you said you had the the raw data to be able to go back and and calculate that. I wonder though if you could expand on that a little bit. The effort to be able to calculate. Um, that specific metric from raw cracking data and any challenges you had with that and and maybe yep. what's your experience with repeatability of that measure? so uh it, it, it again just to our two cracking indices uh we look at uh we, we really have kind of a structural cracking indice and a transverse cracking indice and those are created both on both of them on severity and extent um, when we look at the, the cracking. And we had our, our previously defined, um, I'll call it data collection stream, if you will, as you go across a, a lane of pavement, had five zones, just like the sharp distress manual. Only our wheel path was 0.75 meters for each wheel path. And the, the, the new definition came out with one meter wheel paths, right? So I, I had to go to the vendor and say, uh, you know, look, we need to change the, the protocols here because I got to change my wheel path definition to, to move forward with these things. Did, did we go back and reprocess five years worth of data to do that? No, <laughs> uh, I, I don't really see that there's a whole bunch of, of value there. So when we look at that, we got, okay, here's our severity and uh, extents for all these crackings. Well, really the federal metric only cares if it's cracked or not, right? They're, they're not looking at those things. So I just got the inverse and I got the percent of those wheel paths that didn't have any cracking and, and use that to kind of like backs, backwards sum up how much cracking we had um, as a total. And then you calculate it by the lane width and, and the rest of the metric. Okay. Um, so looks like we have a question in the chat of how do you balance managing the NHS and any other systems you manage? Great question. So, so, so we do look at them um, uh, as their own population and we have already, right? We have specific treatments associated with the interstate. We don't necessarily have specific treatments associated with the NHS, but we also have costing differences um, for both of those within our pavement management system. So we, we're going to manage the network as a whole, and, and we can look at either of those populations as, as subsets of that. And I should mention, so the question balance is asked, really comes to, the, the balance comes to where the need actually is. And, and if your interstate is in really good condition and you've done a bunch of preservation on it, then it, it, it kind of looks good for a longer period of time. And you're going to spend some other money elsewhere to, to make sure that the, the rest of the network is following along. I, I will say that our two agency performance metrics are, um, we have a percent very poor threshold, and we also have a travel weighted network average condition. And um, I, I can provide a, a, a link in the chat to uh, our V transparency site where those performance measures are uh, graphed out and shown. Do you, following up on that, do you travel weight individual um, treatment options, either through the benefit, um, the, the 
trying to think what DTIMS calls it, the objective function, um, or after that, as you're as you're making decisions on which recommendations you can actually fund, do you do you factor traffic volume or and or truck uh, traffic volume? Yeah, so traffic volume is a factor in the benefit calculation, and, and we do uh, deal with it that way. Um, and it is kind of funny because you say that and you say, well, okay, how does that really work? Well, it, you, we have sections of the interstate where there's very low traffic volumes, and then other sections of the NHS that have very high ones, uh, depending on what region of the state you're, you're actually in. So uh, I, I think that traffic does a really good job of dividing that up already. So we are doing that as an agency across our entire network. So. Uh, uh, it could be, you know, not even an NHS road with a considerable amount of traffic. And in that case, it's going to get additional benefit as part of that calculation. Thanks. I think maybe as a transition to our discussion, I'll open this, this next question kind of, I'm going to piggyback on that statement and um, I'll, I'll open it up to Bill as well, because you just mentioned you you have like low, low volume interstates, um, so you use traffic volume as a priority rather than functional class. Um, you know, right? You're not really interested in just because it's an interstate is necessarily higher priority than a than a road that carries more traffic. Um, have you run into a situation? Well, you've got less than one percent. Um, poor on your interstate in general, but are you concerned, I guess, and, and maybe as other folks can answer this in the chat, um, where the maximum percent poor on interstate, given that not all interstate carries high traffic volumes, is cause, could cause a conflict with your asset management strategies um, that don't necessarily prioritize interstate, they prioritize overall benefit based on traffic and other factors. So that was that was one of the, the, the concerns when we looked at target setting to start with, Brad, it was exactly that, right? It, you know, how much does what we set as a target kind of control how we manage our entire network? Um, so when we look at those things, we say, okay, let's set the target ultra conservatively and, and continue managing the network the way we are. And, and if we start to uh, approach that 5%, then we're obviously doing something wrong. And, and I think that we would take corrective action on a network wide basis rather than just saying, oh, we better do some more interstate projects next year, right? Right. Bill, do you have a thought on that one yeah um and it's probably just a you know a difference in state and a different the way we do things and we have our our state set up in what is known as uh funding categories and those are there's six distinct funding categories that we use the interstate major arterial minor arterial state secondary urban and municipal types of highways uh, they all have their own individual pot of money and the way we kind of deal with it is we is we monitor the conditions on all of those those different funding categories, and then if it looks like one's fallen behind, then we will make adjustments to that. But when it comes to overall projects, we tend to favor the interstate system over as as the highest priority in the state, more or less by I wouldn't call it written policy, but more kind of verbal policy because that is our most traveled ways in the state, the best way to get from point A to point B. Um, and then uh, from there, we kind of, you know, gradually go down it. And it does seem to correspond with ADT numbers for the most part. Now, the urban funding category obviously is going to have higher concentrations of, of ADT uh, within that. But it also represents a smaller percentage of our highways uh, across the state. Thanks. All right, any other questions for Reed at this time? All right, if uh, not, if any come up, we can certainly ask him, but if not, then let's transition to um, our discussion 
slide and we have a few questions and the hope with this portion um, is not just to be asking questions of uh, Phil and Reed, but these questions are really for everyone. Uh, everyone, all the participants. So we're really interested in um, now that you've kind of got a sense of what's in the guide and um, have some examples of, of what states have done and are doing in setting their pavement targets, we'd like to get a better sense of um, what is going on with everyone else. Um, so you can use the chat. Uh, we would appreciate it if you, if you simply want to type in some answers. We'll walk through each of these. But if there's something you'd like to share or questions you have back to the panel or to the rest of the participants, um, you know, feel free to raise your hand. We can bring you off mute. Um, and, uh, and, and you can ask, ask your questions. We're hoping this will be a bit uh, interactive and we can get folks kind of sharing across between the panel and, and participants. So um, the first question we have um, for everyone, and let's, let's kind of start with, usually something jumps to mind when you think of your process, especially as a lot of states are kind of really jumping into the process right now as HPMS data is cross your fingers available and you're getting your report cards on your um, pavement conditions uh, and, and now have a couple months before you have to report those targets uh, for the next four years. So what is something about your approach that, that you're embarking on um, that is a major challenge for you um, or is there something from your approach that's been a, a benefit um, that you know you didn't necessarily foresee. So there's kind of two parts to that question, and it, it's sort of meant to be a top of mind. So when you think of your target setting approach, what's an oh man, that's something that's really tough, um, or you know here's something about it that uh, little feather we'd like to, to put in our cap. So um, I don't know, uh, Reader Phil, if one of you would like to lead off with that, and other folks as you think about that first one, feel free to raise your hand or enter something into the chat. I, I could start off with that, with uh, the challenges and benefits, and 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 looking at at, at how we developed in uh, in the methods that we have. the The challenge, obviously, as outlined in my slides, was the time con constraints that I have, and then the time that um, it took to actually set up the uh, setting it up in the pavement management system. But the benefit is once it's done, it's, you know, it's, it's in the box, you push the button and it does what it needs to do. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier that way. So, you know, anytime you can automate something like that in your system, it's, it's that much more of a benefit. Um, and, I think I have a little bit more confidence in, in what we're seeing coming out of there as opposed to me trying to um, make a dead, you know, kind of a <laughs> a dead stick projection, I, I guess you could put it, or dead reckoning. That's probably more of a <laughs> more of a term that we started at the beginning. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, and, and I'll chime right in there as, as part two to that. So from... Uh, from a challenge standpoint, you know, I, I think we're still there. So we have some some resource challenges in order of in, in the area of developing a, a entirely new deterioration model specific to a, a new distress that e even under our our back calculating kind of methodology is not 100% you know accurate. And and how much confidence do we do we have in that? Um, but the other one is that. It, that same thing is, is a, I consider a benefit because we have a really good way of handling it moving forward as well. Thanks. I think we see a challenge. So in the chat, um, we have a couple of responses. Uh, so Narinder Coley from uh, New Jersey DOT. Uh, thanks, Narinder. There's one challenge. Uh, is it New Jersey? They're maintaining the pavement management system. So they're not quite where you two are where they could they have that press the button and it's in the box. Um, so they're maintaining their pavement management system using their state measures um, and metrics. And then the target is being set in a completely different metric. So uh, New Jersey actually has a different way of correlating um, the after the fact, uh, the outputs in terms of one set of measures to uh, 
forecasts in terms of another set of measures. And it's actually, thanks for sharing your interviews. It's actually one of the examples we have in, in the guide. Um, and New Jersey was a pilot state uh, for, uh, for our different target setting approaches. So yeah, that is definitely a challenge. I think it's, it's something a lot of states are still struggling with. So um, and I see uh, Angel Gonzalez from uh, from Oklahoma, another pilot state. So thank you for contributing. I'll give you a shout out. Um, and and I think this is a fair point. And the, the federal measures get um, uh, I don't know lambasted a lot. <laughs> Folks definitely um, like to gripe about them, but it does provide a uniform way of um, measuring condition across the states. So um, that is that is good. And you can see that maybe we're not all so different. Um, and we can argue a bit about whether the poor threshold is in the right place or not, I think in particular. Um, but it does give you a good sense of where the different states stack up and, and where there are similarities and where there are differences. So that is a good benefit. Um, Narendra is also pointing out, yeah, 40% of the NHS in New Jersey um, is maintained by other owners. Um, mm -hmm. They've got a turnpike authority that owns the, the bulk of the interstate um, and a big parkway system, um, which is a, almost an interstate system. Um, and then yeah, 83 other owners. So that's uh, 81 of, or eight, about 80 of them are counties and municipalities. So it's, it's a lot of little bits and pieces, which is another challenge for to expect what's gonna happen on that 40% of the network and how do we um, set targets based on that. And there are some assumptions that are discussed in the guide about how New Jersey does that. Um, let's see, John from Connecticut. Um, a challenge is that- hey, Can I just talk oh, about go that? Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thing, uh, yeah. uh, because I, I think that that's a great one, right? And I, I, I wish, I'm at the end of the day, I'm just glad I don't have that problem, right? Uh, <laughs> we have one MPO and we have a fairly small amount of miles as, associated with that MPO. And that MPO is, is really going to, I, I think in most cases, take our lead whenever we're moving in any of these kind of directions. So I, I, I definitely get that part of it. Um, and the and it's it, it's true, right? You're because you have two different methodologies that are out there. You, you've got to have one methodology kind of standalone for the for the target setting thing that you're responsible for setting that you don't have that utmost or how much control is probably variable when you come right down to those things. So, uh, you know, again, two, two big problems that it, uh, I'm lucky that we don't have to deal with. Yep. Um, I see, so Narinder would like to be unmuted. So let me give that a shot, Narinder. And um, I think I can give you permission to, you should now be able to unmute yourself. Hi, Brad. Hi, Brad. Now I can see. I was trying to find the button to unmute myself. I could did not see. So, uh, can you hear me, Brad? Yes. Yes. Okay. I you already explained very, um, uh, very clearly that what challenges we are facing. Yeah. Uh, first, our payment management system is based on our uh, state metrics, and we 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 have to develop. Uh, uh, targets based on federal metrics, that's a big challenge for us. And you are already explained, there is a method explained in the guide. Uh, and also I mentioned that 40% is a big amount of data getting from uh, 83 uh, other owners. It's really big challenge for us. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I, you're not alone in, in that boat. There are several states that have a lot of miles. I see um, Don Foster has her hand up. So, and I know California is another state with that particular challenge. So Don, I don't know if that's what um, you wanted to raise, but the, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, actually I was just gonna chime in. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was just gonna chime in on, um, you know, basically being in the same boat uh, with New Jersey and others because, you know, we just went through this process and um, we actually did get certification on our TAMP. Uh, so that was, or recertification. So, um, so very happy about that. But as far as the target setting process, um, we're in the same boat. Our, our payment management system 
manages um, the entire, entire state highway system across all lanes of travel, whereas the federal metrics is the outer lane only. So that gives you a different good, fair, poor. Um, and so we had to do two separate um, you know, analyses uh, with regards to how we operate the entire state highway system and how we deal with the target setting in the TAMP. Um, and the TAMP, you know, uh, interstate is fully owned by the state, so that's not an issue, but it, the non-interstate NHS is a combination of state and local entities, um, which make up about 35% of the entire system on the non-interstate. So that, um, that was a challenge. Uh, we faced that in the initial TAMP. So as we moved into the new TAMP, um, we knew we needed to come up with a better way of doing it. Um, the first time we basically um, allowed the MPOs, we have 21 of them that have NHS within their regions um, to provide us their targets. And we did a quantity weighted average um, on their lane miles to come up with a statewide target. We used that same methodology, but we came up with a tool that provided consistency and was data-driven for the ability to set targets this time. So basically, just in a nutshell, it uses average annual deterioration rates. Um, each region has their starting condition, good, fair, poor. Um, and then we use investments across the five work types and the unit cost to come up with the performance on an annual basis that will offset deterioration which leaves you with your uh, performance outcomes at the end of the, the period that you're analyzing. So our tool gives us a four-year and a 10-year. It's an Excel-based uh, program, um, very simplified approach, but it did give us an ability to set reasonable targets. So I'll just leave it at that. But we have the same challenge, and I think we had some lessons learned through our first TAMP that allowed us to make improvements um, you know, for the 2022 version. If you don't mind an analogy on, on some of this stuff, it just kind of came to mind as, as some of you might know, I, I have a hobby as a, you know, I, I have an old pickup that I like to work on. And what's the first thing you do if you have to drop a new distributor in that thing? Well, you have to turn the engine, get it to top dead center, you know, so that you can get that distributor in and, and kind of dial it in. And I, I kind of see it that way. You, you have to have a starting point, get everything in there and then as you move it along you you have to kind of dial everything in so it just kind of popped in the head but yeah i think that it kind of sums that up yeah you have to line i have a question for first for don actually <laughs> and this is where uh, you know i love these kinds of things um where are you with respect to to five percent very poor or sorry poor on the the interstate don as a as a state we are um, doing really well on the interstate. I believe, um, I, don't quote me on this, but um, I think we're around 1%. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we set very aggressive targets um, for our state-owned assets um, for pavement. And so we've been able to, to meet those targets across the board. Our challenge, of course, is working across so many local agencies on the non-interstate. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Don. Um, I see just as one more challenge um, in the uh, chat box from Connecticut, um, that the deterioration models are currently overly pessimistic. Um, so some engineering judgment needs to be applied to the outputs. And th that's one I appreciate uh, John from Connecticut offering that because I think that very often um, and, and Connecticut actually has a very mature pavement management system. Um, but particularly when agencies are first starting out, I think as you're working through, you're analyzing data, you're doing some engineering judgment and some analysis to establish your, your deterioration rates, your trigger values, things like that. You're setting up your system. And we tend as, as typically engineers who um, are, are pavement managers, but I think in general, um, and maybe this is universal to people, we, we tend to be a little conservative here and a little conservative there. 
um, because we we don't want to have these uh, the system lead us into overly optimistic outcomes. And I think it often kind of compiles to provide conservative outputs um, that that may show us some some more doom and gloom than than we should expect. So I think that's a really good recognition. Um, on behalf of Connecticut DOT, and not uncommon uh, that that folks have to work work through that. We had a similar conversation last week from Bridges uh, for the same reason. Um, so yeah, that that is a challenge, and 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 you have to build that confidence and and, and find those sources of, of bias um, that you can you can chip away at. Yeah, you you kind of have a balance there of um, you know you you want to make sure that you're conservative enough to have some sort of a fail safe. So in case things kind of go wrong, but at the same time, if you're too conservative with your estimates, it digs into the integrity and people start yes. questioning that. And so you have, yeah, you, you definitely have to strike a balance in there. And uh, a lot of that over the years has come down to, okay, we have a model that's not quite acting right or, yeah, maybe needs to be looked at. And that, that comes down to payment management is not just, okay, we set the model and there it is for the next 10, 15 years. You got to go back and you got to look at things on a regular basis and make sure that everything is, is clicking. Make sure. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Right. Correct there. I, I totally agree with that, Phil. Right. And that's just one of those things, right? That's the, that's the resource part, right? Because you do have to revisit those models. You're using different PG binders than you were 10 years ago. You're using different treatments likely uh, across the network. So mm -hmm. all those things come into play. And I really think that, you know, it's appropriate if you look at an eight to 10 year window before you really have to have some model revision across the board. Awesome, thanks. The, the next bullet is, is somewhat related, um, but it's a little bit more forward looking. So if you're, and this is more, I think, to the, to the audience, um, to the participants, if you are, are, is there a method that you'd like to employ, um, but something holding you back? So it's a little bit like the challenges, um, but it's, is there something holding you back from, um, maybe knowing what factors to apply to your historic trends <laughs> to do a better job of, of um, modifying those trends or something that's holding you back from using your payment management system or running multiple scenarios. Kind of curious about what are the things that, um, you know, beyond a challenge of, of, of what you're doing, what's, what's uh, maybe like a challenge from doing more? Um, and Again, feel free to come off mute or if there's some thoughts you want to put in the in the chat. Nope, oh, we have some more texts that have come in. So um you kind know, of related back to the discussion. So folks can keep putting in the chat. We'll we'll kind of go through these. So um Idaho tried to claim the local NHS is trivial, and so you don't need to track it. Um yeah, and I think um we didn't get that ship to sail. And I think depending on how much you have, um, you may have a shot at that. There, I don't know if there's any state that really owns 100% of the NHS, but there's some states with pretty high 90s. So at some point, you know, it's it's maybe you, you track it, you report it, but how much of an impact um, is that going to have on your overall targets? If, if you know, that 1% of your or 2% gets all reconstructed in the same year, um, you know, it's, it's still not going to move your percent poor <laughs> very much, right? So, um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. And that's one of those things where I think every state has to work that out with their own division office. So if there's anyone from FHWA, I think we have some folks in the office who'd like to um, comment on this local versus state-owned assets on the NHS. I would welcome that as well. Um, Yeah, so Angel uh, Gonzalez again. So under challenges, you can calculate the metrics. Um, it's really having confidence in the deterioration and, and given certain funding scenarios. And, and um, as you build a more robust system, 
that becomes a, there's more things to test, more things to think through. Um, these management systems, regardless of, um, you know, I think the, the speakers today use DTIMs. There's certainly other vendors out there um, and states that have have implemented those systems effectively. So we're not, this isn't necessarily an advertisement um, for one system over another. They're all very complex and powerful tools. So there's a lot to think through. Maybe kind of go along with that, maybe spur a little discussion and it, if they wish to use a different method. But once you establish a method, I, I think it's really important that if it's not in some sort of a system where you do push the button, that you have some way of, you know, you want to document it and make sure that you have it to where if, you know, if tomorrow read isn't there, somebody can pick it up and go with it, you know. I mean, yeah. but that's, you know, that's kind of a general agency type of uh, uh, standard operating procedure you should have. So, yeah, um, I guess as far as South Dakota, we'll, you know, the method we have, we'll just run with it and see where it goes. And if we need to change it, we can. You know? Right. Yeah, Laura from Illinois uh, uh, on the local topic. This is 500 miles of local owned NHS. And so the, the DOT collects the data for all of those miles. And that's another decision that really varies from state to state. Uh, in some cases, uh, maybe some major owners collect it for themselves. Um, in other cases, it may be collected through a different vendor um, or through a vendor if the state collects their own or through a different vendor. Um, and then some states do all the data collection either with their own staff or through the same vendor um, for consistency. So that's something else to, to work out. Um, and then, of course, you always have the, the challenges with data consistency, even when it is through one process, one vendor, one owner. Um, but that's something else to look at. And Lewis from uh, Indiana, Indiana took the time um, to look at what should be and what is the NHS system and did a major reduction in the NHS system working with a local uh, federal aid office. So that's a great point too. When the, the, the definition, my favorite example of that was when the definition of the NHS changed, Times Square was on the NHS. Um, I'm not quite sure how the outdoor advertising requirements went with, <laughs> with that, but it's no, and then it was shut down. Part of it is now pedestrian. Um, so it's no longer on the NHS. They were able to get some projects through to, um, to do that. But that was my favorite example of, oh, there's, there's some things to straighten out here now that the, the definition changed, which was almost a decade ago, right? Thinking back on that, so. Um, so uh, John Hanault, we are in the process of revising those deterioration curves uh, to better represent reality. So yeah, that's an ongoing process. Um, and Dorothy, <laughs> Yeah, so there's 60 miles in Idaho, but you can't ignore those 60 miles, Dorothy. Um, make sure you factor those in. I think we have a few miles less than that. We <laughs> don't have too much at all, you know, especially to get to the western side of the state. I think we have on that side maybe four miles. That's the leading from I-90 to Ellsworth Air Force Base is NHS mileage. And then most of it is centered around Sioux Falls. Um, in that area but yeah there's not very much uh non-state nhs in south dakota thanks um and karen strauss strauss from uh, washington state uh washington state dot was going to change the targets because we didn't have the funding to sustain the percent good that's um not an uncommon story um, to our relief, large funding package came through um, before you were going to announce it. So yeah, saved by the bell. Um, and I, I do think that the the bill or the IIJA, whatever um, you prefer to call it, um, has caused folks to recalibrate um, and in both the terms of pavement condition and system performance and where is the right um, balance between system enhancement, system performance, and asset conditions. I think there's, with this increase 
um, in federal funds, and it varies between states, but you know, 20% or more increase in, in federal funding is what I'm hearing from, from most states, which is not, which is certainly significant. Um, and I think a lot of folks are saying, oh, maybe we can make that target, or maybe we need to direct this funding um, to a different place. Uh, depending on on what our conditions are, or maybe this will help us account for the cost increases that we're seeing, and all that needs to factor in as you're looking a few years out for targets. And in fact, all of those things. One thing we haven't talked about today that we do mention um, in the guide, and we mentioned last week, was that um, it's less so for pavements than for bridges, but uh, particularly for the interim reporting, the the two year interim target. Um, most of the decisions that will impact your performance in year two from now have already been made. The things are already in motion as to what your resurfacings will be that will really be the things that drive your surface conditions um, in calendar year 23 and 24. Um, you know, th those need to be put in place now so there's time to deliver those projects. And there may be some maintenance paving, some simple resurfacings, things like that in 24 that will be still to be decided. But generally how much of that you're going to deliver, which is the big factor, um, that's already set for most states. So um, things like, a, yeah. That's a good point. And on top of all that, you have all these projects out there that are going through the design process and going to be spit out into bid letting. You know, what if they get behind? What if they don't get those projects done? So project delivery has a sense. We have a limited, and Reed, I'm sure you have a limited construction season and when you could do anything. If you have a bad year and you can't get all your projects done in a particular year, they're going to be carried over to the next year and that's going to monkey with your projections, you know, and, and what you're, what you're seeing for your, what your actual performance numbers are going to come up. There's, there's a yeah. myriad of things. Yeah. That, and, that and, and you know, we really, we really focused on pushing the projects out the door with the extra money that was, uh, was out there. And, and now it's like, well, are, are they all going to get built? <laughs> Yeah, and then you have to look at availability of contractors. Is there going to be enough contractors to do all this work? Um, enough labor? You know, there's been talks about, you know, not enough truckers out there to haul asphalt, for instance, and get it, you know, get materials where they need to be. So there's, and then not to mention, you know, inflation and the fuel prices and things like that. So that, that's all a factor. Yeah, that's echoed. I see uh, Shane, uh, Shane uh, Timkowitz uh, from Iowa echoing that the risk of inflation forces over the past six months um, and the impacts on the full, you know, if the can impact whether the full program can be delivered. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of, it's an interesting time to be setting targets right now. I do have to say that. I think there's a lot of things to, to be thinking about and how long will some of these trends continue? Um, you know, that's something to consider too when, when looking forward, but and potential material shortages. Yeah, other other things that'll that are challenging right now for our target setting. Um, and we're certainly seeing that across um, other areas of, of construction. Um, I'm not sure how that is working with paving materials right now, um, but certainly things I've heard that from signals and ITS um, components, uh, even if you can, you might get a reasonable price on it, but then the contractor can't, can't get the parts, so. That we are definitely seeing that in transportation in general. All right. Um, so thanks. And I, I we can, as folks kind of, I'll go through these bullet points. But if, if again, if folks have some thoughts you'd like to contribute in the chat, I appreciate um, everybody that's contributed so far. And please encourage you to, to, to keep it up. This is great. And I think we're taking some notes. I think there's a few things we may end up um, tweaking in the, in the research um, from this, which was one of our objectives. So next, now thinking more positively from challenges, um, have you been able to leverage the target setting at, or performance review process to bring about new actions, um, changes in policy, changes in priority, um, changes in attitude even, <laughs> or understanding? Um, now that we have this process and you know we may um, not entirely appreciate all aspects of it, but what are 
has this enabled you to advance um, asset management, payment management in some way? Um, you know, just to kind of go with that, before we had the federal measures, we had targets that we set and that were performing. And to this day, those are still our targets, you know, as shown in the slideshow that I had. And I don't think we're going away from that. So like I said, it's, it's just mainly converting it to the data we need it for to be able to report that out. Um, so I guess from target setting in general, yes, it does leverage our decisions and what we do, but it's not that set of data that we use to set our targets. We, we use our state, uh, our state data to do yeah. that. Yeah, then, and I would just add to that, that you know, I we haven't had to leverage that to at, at this point, but I think that there is a bigger awareness of, of what pavement condition metrics are as a whole. Right. So more folks are aware that this is a thing, and then in the case, and in, in, in your case, and like Phil said, then you can direct them towards if there's something that's more meaningful. Um, to you, you can direct them that way once the interest is established. So, yeah, and I will say, I think in South Dakota's case, that maybe this happened years ago as you implemented those other targets, as you implemented um, uh, pavement management, that it really did, I think, change and has influenced very directly the way the pavement funds and your way funding in your state gets directed to pavement and what projects. Um, it's kind of evolved when we first, when the payment management system came online in 93, 94, in that, you know, just a little bit before my time, they were just basically using backlog miles and, and numbers and what they needed to bring that up. And as time went and we saw different, uh, different directors come in, they kind of changed and evolved into, into more of a performance base rather than a backlog base type of system. And that's what we see today is looking at the performance base. And then with our last major change in funding with our state Senate, we always refer to it as Senate Bill 1, which was what, five, six years ago now that we, we made that change. Then the state legislature holds us to our targets and basically uh, says if, you, like I said in the slideshow, if you can't make them, then you need to show us what you need to do to get to that target. What do you need? What money do you need? You know, things like that. Yeah, great. Um, I see a question from Don. I'm gonna throw this out to the group too. It's there in the chat. I think it's a great question. Uh, I think there's a really short answer to it, but I would be curious if folks would be willing to elaborate their experiences as everyone setting targets in conjunction with their 2022 TAMP. So what Caltrans did uh, I think is great, a, a great approach. And that was um, not necessarily because their TAMP was due so early, they had to have it submitted to FHWA by March. The, the idea of waiting for the, the official 2021 uh, data year collected to be reported out in terms of the federal measures wasn't really an option. Um, and they wanted their, and Don, I'm speaking for you a little bit, so feel free to um, unmute and correct me, but wanting their asset management strategies um, and in life cycle strategies to influence their investment strategies and the outcomes from their investment strategies to influence their target setting, they really did align these two processes. So, um, and, and as you mentioned, there's a very elaborate process um, to bring in all the owners um, literally hundreds of participants from local owners to contribute to that, um, to set targets based on expected investment strategies um, through the TAMP. So it moved in lockstep. Um, so not every state it has, has married their TAMP and target setting processes um, like that. I think actually probably very few have, um, Except I, I now believe that with the flexibility in submission deadline for the TAMP that FHWA has offered, um, there are other states out there that are going to be submitting an initial TAMP. And in the second TAMP, while they are addressing um, 
the requirements for uh, considering extreme weather and resilience in their life cycle plans um, and, and risk analysis, they will be addressing this target setting TAMP timing disconnect. So in the there wasn't an intention to marry them, but now there's another opportunity to now marry a revision, a quick revision of the TAMP with the target setting. Um, so I see uh, from, from Todd in Indiana, Indiana put their draft targets in the new TAMP, um, but there's no way to actually set the targets before they see the HPMS. So I think that's where most folks were. And HPMS is um, challenging <laughs> this year. So I've had uh, some issues. <laughs> so, um, but I'm not that, the one to talk to about that one. That's, right. that's another guy downstairs <laughs> and his woes that he had with it. Uh, Jeff. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and so um, so Indiana's in that boat. I know many states, um, and I think it depends on how close you are to some thresholds, maybe with percent poor or how mu how much variability you've seen year to year um, in those federal measures, and how confident you are setting targets ahead of seeing the 2021 results and being able to match that up with the TAMP. Uh, Laura, I see from Illinois, has pointed out since their TAMP isn't due until November. Um, then they actually have a chance to do this. Now that they have everything in place and over the next uh, five months can align these two processes and finish their TAMP and, and set their targets. And that so, only makes sense. I mean, if yeah. you have a new four-year target range coming in, you, you definitely want to get it documented in your TAMP what that target is going to be rather than have a TAMP come in and then later oh yeah. well here's the new targets i mean that's four years you know that's <laughs> yeah that's and, uh, yeah yeah that is um was very much a concern and and uh, i've i've heard from states i see steve from alaska so in, in alaska's case they're not expecting changes to the to the targets so they're able to kind of roll through um and they, and they can extend them so that allows them to to match up um, as relatively conservative targets um, in Alaska. So anybody else wanna contribute to this decision? Um, yeah, so uh, John's a believer setting them in conjunction with asset management group. That's Connecticut, correct, John? So, um, and, and that's the, I didn't mention the example of scenario analysis that I showed earlier was from the Connecticut DOT TAM. So I think Connecticut, DOT as, as is a good example of a state that has very much married um, the target setting um, and the TAMP development processes so that the, their life cycle plans are the foundation that both their asset management investment strategies and their targets are set on. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Vermont is not. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, and I think, like I said, I think the new changes with the submission dates have thrown a lot of things, and there's going to be a lot of um, slight differences in how states have tackled this, and a lot of different approaches between between the 52 DOTs. I, I think we have an extension into the November, also, if I'm not mistaken, and that will give us time. And but I don't think i mean the projections i have right now i don't i don't think are going to change from now until november so we could have submitted that you know when it was due and and yeah. still had it we were set i mean but without having that um having the nhs non-interstate even in um hpms yet which isn't due till june you know yeah it's it really doesn't make sense to, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's like left hand, right hand, or or is it left hand? No, <laughs> whichever, you know. <laughs> well, I think Angel's comment in the chat really gets to that. So um, HBMS may still be pending, but they have a good idea of what the pavement performance will be. So the, the targets in TAMP can move forward and barring some shocking revelation from HPMS when, when the report card shows up, 
um you know they'll they're they're they have married them they can walk through i think there's several states in that boat as well so yeah great question don thank you if anybody else has questions for the group yeah please follow that lead and, and feel free to share them these are kind of things that the bullets on the screen were things just to kind of prompt discussion but if there's other more uh pressing topics that folks would like to to bring to this this group it's um you know not often we get these hundred folks together so um so the next bullet gets to that this, this word effective and what is effective for your agency so um i've paired that with a, another nebulous word of elements <laughs> so i guess what has a what part of your performance target uh setting process has um helped it be effective for your agency however you want to define that and i see we actually have a we have a raised hand um yeah hey brad this is clint from on um, the federal clint. highway pennsylvania division but i i did want to a little bit back on that last point we talked about aligning the tamp here in pennsylvania they already submitted their tamp and we agreed that they would put in there more of what the process is going to be coming up yeah. but i'm curious for other states you know as you decide which target setting methodology you're going to use i know in pennsylvania it well you got to know where you were so you need your data so they've got their data you've got to have your trends and they've got all kinds of deterioration curves that they're always updating but then there's kind of two ways to do it from there is which pieces of pavement are going to get improved with projects or is it just well we have this much money and so we'll do this many miles of pavement therefore we're going to assume some sort of improvement and PennDOT tends to use their planned projects you know so they had to or were trying to wait to kind of match up with their tip so their statewide tip is the fy23 tip is sort of draft right now and so i'm one curious what other states kind of are waiting to see what projects are planned over the next two or four years for setting their targets um or or do you just go with how much money you're going to have as as a generic so kind of back on that other question so we we needed three things to align in pennsylvania the performance target setting the tamp and the tip I love that question. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that because our, you know, our step doesn't get finalized until October, but we do have a tentative step that we work on. And usually it doesn't change all that much, but it can. So that that's a good point. I, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, you know, the, the step or tip, you know, kind of depends on that. So I, I will say generically, I know a couple states where um, the timing, again, the timing of this, this extension to address otherwise not really relevant, <laughs> directly relevant to target setting extreme weather and resilience um, is giving the state that opportunity to, um, boy, we were on a, on a path because of the due date to submit a TAMP I apologize. I think I had an audio issue there. Um, we were on a path to submit a TAMP based on the, the 2022 tip step that was passed in 2021. But now, again, it'd be really nice putting out a four-year plan to be able to use the, the step that's becoming current with that plan versus one that's a year old. And um, this new timing is allowing the state, well, while we make our TAMP compliant with the new statutory requirements, we will also take the time um, to adjust our investment strategies to reflect this, this new step. Um, and that will, but then that impacts your performance gap analysis as you look at forecasted conditions and other parts of your TAMP. So it's, it makes it a much bigger change to the TAMP than, than um, if you are only addressing how the resilience is is considered in in life cycle uh, analysis and uh, risk analysis. So there are some states that are biting off a bigger part of that that apple now um, that they have a chance. Or a case like I, I assume Laura for you in Illinois um, and for Connecticut with tamps that are all, we're already due in the fall, it becomes a little bit easier to align those things. Any other thoughts there? Um, 
from I, states that are tackling well, this? Well, I, I think we, from, from the Vermont side, I think we kind of have a little bit of both there, right? Because the, the projects that are committed that we have an awareness for are, are included in that analysis and therefore uh, handled by the forecasting side from the payment management system. And then the additional money based on our expected funding is available to do additional projects. So uh, our forecasting is still the best we can make it. It's just kind of two pieces are feeding what that uh, output actually is from a project versus budget standpoint. Yeah, excellent. I think that's that's a pretty typical process where you bring in the projects that you know, and then there's usually some unprogrammed funds that you then let the system figure out what is reasonable to do with. So um, you're not just looking at the money and figuring out, well, generally how many lane miles would we do? You're, you're, you're trying to be as precise as you can with where that funding would, would go. Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty typical. All right. Any other thoughts on, so any thoughts I want to, um, I think we, we only have about 10 minutes left. The conversation has been great. Um, so I'm going to kind of combine, um, the, the, the third to last bullet and the, and the last bullet there. Cause, um, I, I think part of this idea of being effective is, is supporting communication. That's kind of a key part of it. in order to be effective. I think with target setting, there's, it, it, part of that is com helping communicate your agency's objectives and the way the agency is delivering the program and why. Um, so I'd like to kind of pivot to that and open the conversation up to any examples or questions related to using targets to communicate um, or, or any uh, questions about uh, communications within the target setting process um, within your agency. Are there anything um, about needing to communicate in order to set effective targets? Thoughts when it comes to communications and target setting? Now, are there any agencies that, um, I think Don provided a pretty good example of the level of communication they needed to go through to set targets in California. Um, I, I think it's an area where I, I could do more, especially communicating the with the MPO side of that. Um, I, you know, they were really, I think, going to follow our lead it, when we first started down this, and, and our targets may not be appropriate as their target. So I, I think there's some more work to do for us uh, with the MPO. From the, the communicate with the, the leadership thing, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm really going to stay with our agency performance measures. And, and we have thresholds identified for our agency performance measures. If they want to see the national performance measure dashboard, they're more than able to do that. Yeah. And the, the, the public, you know, they, they get it from 5,000 different ways, depending on who's given them the information, right? right. I, I, many times I've had to respond to the, well, Vermont is ranked 47th in the state in pavement condition. Well, uh, based on what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and some people are just, hey, here's the IRI, and this is good, fair, and poor, right? It, it's not right. even the, the national performance measure thing in some cases. Right. Um, I see a couple of things in the, the chat. Uh, so Steve's provide Steve from Alaska has provided some further elaboration on um, their process and uh, yeah, rel set relatively conservative targets, um, but looking at, you know, whether or not they need to, they should be decreasing those, um, particularly for the percent poor. That's kind of the decision on the table right now. Um, yeah, and less than 1% of the NHS um, is is owned by other agencies, so it's about 22 miles in Anchorage, so not not very much there. But I, the last part of your comment there, Steve, I think really thank you. It it, um, it speaks to communication. So um, you know they 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 went through the analysis and pavement and bridge management and kind of boiled things down to you know one pagers. 
um, that include all the relevant information on the target settings. So metrics, measures, targets, conditions, GIS, um, dashboard, all of that. And so they can then from that facilitate discussions um, when you meet with the MPOs, um, when new staff um, come on board on either side, there's these fact sheets that are available to help convey, you know, this is what we measure, this is why it's important, this is where um, how we manage for performance and, and where we expect to be. Um, so yeah, that's great kind of moving forward from, to, to make sure because there's folks who may have are involved now who weren't involved four years ago and that'll always be the case. Um, so yeah, thanks. That's a, a good example of some communications tools. Brad, this is Dawn again. Um, I just wanted to follow up with that. You know, Caltrans also did a lot with our MPOs this last go around to provide them more information through GIS, um, also on financial data that we were able to get from our state controller. Um, so we also communicated much more this last time um, because the MPOs, you know, we do coordinate with them much closer in the process um, just because, you know, it's just very, very difficult to try to get down to every single local agency. We did our best. I think we did a lot of outreach but there's still more work to do, to do in California as well. Um, I think we can definitely do more in that area because, you know, I still feel even working with the MPOs that Caltrans is taking the lead and they, they follow, um, you know, the process fairly well. But I do think the experience level on their end and um, trying to really take this to the next level is going to continue to be a challenge for us. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Communication is going to be key um, and, and, and staying coordinated as they all, as locals become more and more engaged with asset management, it is a good thing. Um, but that introduces more and more options for directions that they can go and different priorities and tools and measures. And, um, you know, there does become a need for standardization to help facilitate um, the ability to communicate. So yeah, good good point. Um, yeah, no, the efforts at Cal California that you went through um, over the last year to develop your TAMP is, is pretty impressive. And I think a, a great example that others um, are gonna look to um, in the future as, as folks continue to get an understanding of it who, who weren't directly involved. Um, but yeah, co coordinating all of those folks uh, within and outside the agency for that size of a program was, um, pretty amazing accomplishment, I think. Um, and I see, so Connecticut is also an agency, thanks John, um, is meeting with the MPOs and, and the leadership team as you're setting the targets and see that as a big um, uh, effort ahead of formally um, reporting the targets to FHWA to make sure that that communication takes place. And that's gonna vary from state to state again, and how, um, how many MPOs, or not even how many, maybe how much of the system is covered by an MPO. In the case of New Jersey, they only have four MPOs, but they cover 100% of the highways in the state. So, <laughs> so it's not many to deal with, but, but they're always working with an MPO. Um, and, and yeah, communication there is, is very important um, to understand what the process is, is they tend to be more focused on, I think there were a lot of MPO participants, for example, in the safety and uh, system performance uh, webinars in this series um, than there are necessarily today. They, they, they don't tend to get as engaged when it comes to uh, infrastructure conditions. Um, so that is an opportunity, again, to make sure that we're on the same page and everybody understands the importance and how asset conditions and system performance fit together overall. Um, with that, we have a, just a couple of minutes left. I'll just open the floor in case anybody has any other questions or comments that they would like to contribute. So Angel's asking, has there been a discussion on some type of peer exchange to communicate what effective target setting looks like? Um, how targets are being set and, or how to set targets in general, challenge successes. So, so as part of this project, um, there these are virtual workshops to help 
set the guide. And then there's another phase of this project uh, in particular where um, we will have some workshops following publication of the guide or while the guide is under uh, publication. So there will be more from this project on effective target setting, um, an additional phase. And then I, I do think this is a topic that's continuing on. Have there been any peer exchanges to, to date, I guess, on this topic? Or is there anything else on the calendar that, that um, folks would like to offer? There's also the National Conference on um, performance management, I didn't get the name of it quite right, that's a, a TRB conference that's scheduled for this December in um, Providence, Rhode Island. So where I expect these this target setting round to be a big topic um, there. So something to keep your eye on. And if you just go to TRB, look at their calendar for conferences, um, that might be a good opportunity. So with, with that, I think we are at um, our time, uh, four o'clock Eastern. So I will thank you all for your, uh, your participation, particularly our speakers, uh, Phil and Reed, thank you so much. Um, your presentations and your, your answers to the questions were uh, really helpful, uh, I, I think, to the group and really appreciate your time. And same to everyone else. Thank you all. This was a great discussion, a very effective workshop, hopefully for you. And I know it was for the research team. We definitely have some, I've been jotting down notes, we definitely have some takeaways for our work. So thanks, everyone, and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.